everyone. Um, so I have this thing that I really uh, get sometimes annoyed at when we're at conferences, and um, when people are taking pictures of the screens because you know that you may or may not actually get the presentation after the deck or at a time where it's, when it's actually reasonable. So there's a QR code. If you would like to download the presentation right now so that you don't hope that I actually give it to you at the end, here you go. Here is a PDF that you can actually download, download from SlideShare. So let's get started. The product owner teams, maybe a team of Incredibles. How many of you work in an organization that has more than one team? OK, good. That's what I would hope would happen if you came to a talk that was about a team of product owners. Um, so let me just tell you a little bit about myself. Um, back in the 90s, I was a Visual Basic developer. Yes, you can forgive me for that. I, I apologize for that. Um, but I, I had this other problem. I was working in a credit card or retail um, industry and, and a company that dealt specifically with credit cards. And I was faced with this really big problem of the company was not really focused on continuous learning. And all I really wanted to do was be an MCDBA. I really wanted to get my certification in being an MCDBA. And they were like, you know what? We're not going to pay for your certification, and we're not going to uh, pay for you to get to learn new things. And I know that you keep bringing up this .NET thing, so um, you're, you're, you're going to have to read it on your own and learn it on your own, and you're not actually going to be able to apply it here. So I went and I worked across the street at this other company, which was based in healthcare. It was also a Fortune 100 company in the States. And I had this really interesting situation where I was the rogue IT person that was hired in because they were kind of a startup within this Fortune 100 company. And the IT people couldn't help them or didn't have enough time to actually focus on their specific problems even though this was going to be a really big benefit for the organization. When I started in that group, there were about 10 people, and we grew that organization to about 500 people in six years, a billion dollars of annual revenue for that specific division. And then we were sold off to another company. After that, I went on and said, so, okay, let's go work at this other company, where I got to work in power generation and then in aviation. Are you hearing a theme? I like to work in highly regulated industries, because that's kind of fun, and mother, uh, most people would say that it's painful. Um, but because of that experience and kind of growing up through the organization and being this person who's always battling status quo, I found myself really focusing on scaling and figuring out how can large organizations with many people solve meaningful problems and be impactful in solving our customers' problems. Um, one of those problems that I've recently had the opportunity to work on is actually implementing Scrum in an operating room in a hospital in Boston, Massachusetts, um, that has about 48 operating rooms. So getting them to scale, that's a little bit different than what we're talking about here um, in most of the training sessions. Also, just so that you know, I am from the States. Um, if you didn't hear that from my voice, um, two people in a row on this stage from Colorado. Um, so my um, husband is an aerospace engineer, and my son is a freshman at um, Colorado University at Boulder. So that's just a little bit about me. So let's get into this. We're going to talk about product owners and why is it important for them to actually work together as a team. Can anyone tell me what is this? Don't be shy. Okay, how about if I give you a little bit more information? What is this? Ah, now a couple of people say it's the Eiffel Tower, okay? But if you are maybe not from Europe and you haven't actually been to the Eiffel Tower, I might have to give you a few more cues for you to figure that out. And part of the reason of that is perspective. So, why? Oop, there we go. Why? Why would we maybe see different things from, from different points of view? Why would certain people be able to point out and know that that was the Eiffel Tower, even though they didn't have to see the whole picture? Come on. Huh? They've been there, so they've had some experiences. What are some other things that 
might cause you to have a different perspective. You know what Paris looks like? Yeah. So there are lots of different things that we could actually um, go into how people look at things and how people see things and how they interpret them. So we've heard uh, in some of the other talks about biases. So it might be the specific context. It might be the limited view like we just uh, showed. It could be the values of the people who were there and what they've been able to experience. Maybe they've specialized in certain domains in certain areas of the world. Maybe they have different beliefs and, again, different experiences. So if we could think about how could we pull together people with all of these different perspectives and actually deliver impactful and meaningful products to our customers, maybe we should think about having product owners come together instead of being siloed and working on a specific team or being able to support a specific team. So let's talk about this. Um, in the top here, we have a picture. Um, I was at a power plant, and we were working on an application because we found that mechanics were spending half of their time filling out paperwork and working in an ERP instead of turning wrenches and fixing machines. This is at a Lean Six Sigma organization. So that's probably a problem that we're paying very expensive people um, to, to do paperwork. But they got a lot of the product owners together, and we actually went and did a customer field trip. How many of you do customer field trips today? OK, a few people. Um, how many of you are, are actually product owners or work in some sort of product? OK. Um, so I've got some. Oh, maybe. OK. Um, well, we would highly recommend that you go as a product owner and see your customers instead of just talking to them. Look at their specific problems and understand what those problems are. But maybe we should think about doing some of these things as a team. Because if I have a group of people who are standing around looking at a specific problem, I might have different perspectives. I might have different ways of maybe thinking about different solutions or different hypotheses that I could come up with to solve a problem. In the top right hand here, we have um, my friend Amy. She's another product owner. And uh, thankfully, I had the opportunity to travel around Europe talking to some of our customers. And here we've got, here's our product. We're putting it in front of our customers. And we're guiding uh, the, the customer from the side. But we would always make sure that we were working on this together, just like you might pair when you're coding and developing. And then you've got a picture of us um, at, an, at an airline that you might know about. So, oh, there we go. Um, so we go to a customer. We're building these wonderful tools. And we understand the vision of them. And we need to have empathy and understand who our customers are. We need to have that perspective. Um, so Amy and I are traveling around to different places um, in the world. And we get to these two different customers. Can you tell me what the difference is between these two customers? Any ideas? One has a window, yes. So he gets to see the sun. That, that's a nice thing. But if you were building digital products, there's something key to these two pictures. Well, that would be that our gentleman with the, with the windows, he actually has three monitors, plus he has a laptop that he could flip open. So he has the ability to see you know, lots of different data. Whereas on the other hand, we have um, a person with just one teeny tiny monitor, and he has like a, a computer, not a, a laptop. So that's interesting. Um, but by having two of us, or multiples of us, being able to go and see who the customers are and to pull all of these different things about the specific work environment, we can then come back to the team and share the experience. And we can share the hypotheses that we might come up with to help our customers solve their problem. Now, in this particular case, we're talking about keeping airplanes in the sky. So that's kind of an important thing. Does everybody agree? Yeah, especially if you're on a plane every single week, like I happen to be. So what is a team? Anyone? Yeah, two or more people who are working together with a common goal. So then the question would be, what are those characteristics of a team?
Different specialties, okay. What else? Their co collaboration. Oh yeah, chemistry, that, that would definitely be important as well. So hopefully they're working together, they're focused on quality, um, they're also helping each other become more T-shaped and, and growing each other. Um, they're cross-functional, they have the ability to solve a problem um, on their own without hopefully having to pass things back and forth. And they're also focused on excellence of their product or whatever it is that, that is the outcome of that particular team. So an interesting byproduct of having a team of product owners who are working together, going out, talking to our customers, experiencing some interesting things are that sometimes you find yourself on the other side of the planet on the weekend and you get to go and do something fun like fortune telling in Turkey with the bottom of the, the coffee there, or maybe bike riding in, in Paris as well. Why would that be important? Well, if we look at um, Patrick Lencioni's Five Dysfunctions of a Team, he says that it's important for us to actually build trust. And by having the time that we are spending together at our customers, but also in that extra time, we have the ability to start to break down some of these barriers. We have the ability to start to be a little bit more vulnerable. Because we're now becoming more vulnerable and we are building trust within those teams, we can now start to increase um, our levels here within this five dysfunctions of a team. Now that we're at working together as a team and we're not focused on our specific um, product that we have traditionally worked on, now we have the ability to challenge each other and say, hey, I was thinking about this thing for my portion of the product, but it would work really well with your thing. And we're actually creating this conflict which allows more and more people uh, to come up with better ideas. And they're using that diversity of thought to create better products for our customers. That then helps them with creating the commitment and actually delivering on what they need to. They're gonna be more accountable to delivering, and then they'll actually look at the results and they'll um, focus on the collective outcomes. So let's, talk, let's look at a couple of examples. Um, so in the States, we use Waze. Do you guys have uh, driving traffic problems here? No, yes, maybe? Okay, so um, <laughs> if we look at Waze, so Waze is the thing that tells me which way to get home because traffic in Denver is absolutely dreadful, it's absolutely awful, but now they have an integration with Spotify, and you guys have heard of Spotify, right? Yeah, Spotify. So now I can have Waze show and connect directly to Spotify, but they're not even owned by the same company. But I can figure out how can we start to work together across to product owners um, to integrate on multiple products. And then how many of you have ever worked on an ERP, like SAP or Oracle EBS? I see a couple of hands like, I don't really want to confess to this. But this is where this really starts to come into play. Um, unfortunately, as, as well as working on very complicated, highly regulated industries, I somehow keep getting pulled into these ERP implementations. Um, so we go in and someone says, well, I'm the order management product owner, and I'm the finance product owner, and I don't know anything about that other thing. But of course, as we start to break into these things, they do know a lot more. And if we actually got them to work together and to share the information, we would be able to deliver the, the things that are more important to our customers faster because we're not siloing the work that the teams have to do based on the product owner's knowledge. And then an example at the bottom, that customer support site. So maybe if I have a customer who has a problem with a technical manual, they can submit an inquiry directly from there instead of having to go back and um, back out to kind of the homepage of the application. So as these teams of product owners start to work together, they start to understand the bigger picture of the overall product. And they can start to figure out how can we work together to solve these problems in the best and most efficient way. So what happens if the product owners aren't there? What happens if the, there is no backlog? Um, and because I work in a lot of Scrum at Scale implementations, because I work for Jeff Sutherland, the guy who created or is a co-creator of Scrum and the creator of, of Scrum at Scale, um, I'm, I'm generally in these situations where we go into organizations and there is no backlog. And the leadership team says, 
oh, by the way, um, these are our most important things. And the team is like, well, this is the stuff that we actually know and understand. And so we're just going to work on the stuff that we know and understand. And as you've heard through a number of the different talks this week, um, because uh, 65% of the features are rarely or never used, or in some cases we heard even 80% of those things are rarely or never used. We have teams working on things that are really not the most important thing. So we need to make sure that as product owners, we're listening to our customers, we're understanding what their wants and needs are, we're showing them things that we've actually created, and hopefully we're getting them to tell us what they hate about our product, and we're being vulnerable enough to ask for, what do you hate about my product? then we have the ability to actually prioritize these things. So I'm going to tell a little um, American story. Um, has, has anyone ever seen American football? Not soccer. OK, got a couple of hands. So I, I'm going to play the quarterback here. So I'm the quarterback of, of a football team, and I have an offensive line who's right in front of me. And they're guarding me as the quarterback from the, from the defense. And there's this famous quarterback who is from both Indianapolis and then also from Denver, where I live. And he's famous for using this word, Omaha. And so he, he's, got, he's standing there with like his hands right behind the guy's butt. And so he's taken a look at his competitors, and he can immediately say, hey, wait a second. This play isn't going to work. He knows that by the way that the other team is lined up, whatever play it was that they were planning on doing, it's not going to work. And so he yells out to the team. He says, Omaha. And the team knows, hey, we're going to go with a different plan. We call that an audible in American football. We know that if we can have product owners who have a bigger and better understanding of the, of the backlog, and they're not just being spoon-fed the little things that they're being told to go fix, but they understand the intent and the reasoning behind why we're trying to solve these problems, that we can actually make teams more successful, that we can make products more successful. And so in the case of Peyton Manning, the quarterback for both the Indianapolis Colts and the Denver Broncos, he was able to win two Super Bowl rings. And that's because he was fully empowered, I will say as a product owner, to be able to look at what the competition was doing and then to figure out what do we need to do next? And I don't need to go and ask my management team. I don't need to follow up with my vice president. I'm empowered as a quarterback to make the call and to make the decision for the team. So the Standish Group released a report in 2018. And they said that projects where the decision latency is less than one hour are 58% likely to succeed. How many of you have the ability as a team to be able to make decisions in less than an hour? I've seen some hands like shoot up real quick. How many of you are waiting for more than five hours because I've got to send an email to someone who then is going to have to go knock on a door? OK, <laughs> I see a couple of hands there too. So we need to figure out how can we actually empower the product owners who are with the teams how can we get them to understand the larger problem and then be able to make decisions to solve those problems as quickly as we possibly can? Because I'd rather make a decision and go do something and find out something instead of waiting for five hours or, in many cases, much longer. Um, I was in an organization. It was an oil and gas company, um, one of my clients. And I actually had to go and like beat up the VP of engineering because they raised an impediment to him and they were just kind of, he was waiting and he said, Whoa, well, I sent this person an email and I was like, she sits in the office next to you. Just walk over and talk to her. Um, so for some reason, many corporations, they think it's okay to just, oh, I'll send the email or I'll wait for the decision. I won't actually make a decision right now. OK, so we've talked a little bit about what product owners are responsible for, or a team of product owners. Um, but here are some uh, specific bullets to talk about. This first one, this is not in the Scrum Guide, but this is something that I actually think is extremely important. Um, an inspirational vision for products and making it visible to the organization. 
I was in um, that, one of those organizations, and we went to a, pro, or a team, and we specifically asked, like, hey, what are you doing? What are you working on? And the people on the team were like, well, we create these charts, we generate these graphs, and then they go on to this portal, and then I guess somebody looks at them. Is that the sign of a good product owner? Absolutely not. No, those charts were being generated to show vibrations in an aircraft engine that made sure that the airplane stayed in a sky. <laughs> so the actual inspirational vision of that is we're monitoring engines so that we can predict events before they actually happen. So as the product owner and as a team of product owners, we have to keep our eye on what is that big picture and how do we communicate that and make that an inspirational vision that's visible to the team. The next thing is, how do we actually create a prioritized backlog? Well, I, as a product owner for this group, might think that this thing is important, but another product owner might think that something else is important. But we have to come together as a team, and because we have trust, and because we've, we're okay with conflict, but because we've committed to actually delivering specific things, now we can come together as a team and prioritize that backlog. So now, when there's a conflict between, hey, I need this team to help me with this particular thing, this impediment, or this other impediment, as a team, a team of teams, we actually have the ability to know what are the most important things, and how do we make sure that we're focusing on the most important things? And then another thing that we've heard through many of the sessions this week are monitoring metrics. We're not just using our gut to say, hey, are we building the right things? Are we getting the right outcomes? Hopefully we have a hypothesis. Hopefully we know what actions we're gonna take and what we're going to measure to see should we continue down this path? Or is there another question that we should be asking? Do I double click into that and see what's going on? Or do I need to maybe step back and say, you know what, this one didn't work. And if we know that half of the time the customers aren't gonna want our stuff, it's okay for us to try things and for them not to work. So let's talk about product owner teams and what this could look like. So if I think about a team that's actually delivering work, working product, hopefully they're cross-functional, hopefully you have all of the people who are needed to do the actual work, maybe they're a little bit focused on the next couple of sprints or the next couple of iterations. Now remember, I do work for the guy, Jeff Sutherland, who created Scrum, so that's why I'm a little bit more leaning to that place, but my number one rule is always use common sense. Um, so if they're focusing on sprints, hopefully they're focusing on delivering working product so that we can actually get validated learning, so that we can actually put something in front of our customer and the customer can either say, yay, that was awesome, we love it, this is solving all of our problems, or yeah, that didn't hit the mark at all, right? And then we would ask if you were using Scrum or whatever uh, framework that you're using, to do the three, five, three, right? Hopefully we have the, the three events, the five, or the, the three roles, the five events, and the three artifacts. But as long as we look at how is the work actually flowing, take a look at our product, and then look at a time to retrospect, um, that's what we're really um, focused on. So then the question comes into, what about when we move into this team of teams? So if I have a product that requires more than one team and they need to work together, how do I do that? Well, maybe I could get the product owner team to start to focus and work together as a team. If you're doing Scrum, maybe they'll do Scrum. Maybe they'll get up and they'll start to do daily stand-ups every single day. But maybe they might need some help from some other people. So if you're doing software, maybe you're including a UX person because you know the customer journey is kind of important, that whole you know, interaction thing. Um, maybe you'll include people who had pre previously been architects. So who are the people that are required to look at what do we need to do to put into the backlog? How do we learn about our customers? How do we actually build a roadmap that we can deliver on? And maybe they'll do scaled events, but hopefully they're taking time to uh, do some sort of reflection. Then when we get all the way down to the bottom, those people who you know, have the big, the big paychecks, they're at the bottom for a reason. They're the foundation, they're the servant leaders. They're explaining to the organization why do we actually need to do this stuff? Why do we exist as an organization? 
They're making sure that that vision is completely clear to the organization, and they're removing any roadblocks or removing any impediments so that the teams can actually go and do the stuff that we want them to do. Now, I want to make this very clear. We've got circles going in both directions. This is bi-directional. This is not leadership going and saying, here's the problem, and this is how you are going to solve it. This is putting Peyton Manning at the very top and saying, hey, you're empowered to make decisions. You understand what the vision of the company is. You understand what the vision of the products are. Put stuff into your backlog that makes the most sense. Respond to your customers based on their needs. Don't come to us and ask for permission for everything. So if we take a look at um, some of the things that they might actually be focusing on, so the, the teams at the top who are actually delivering stuff for our customers, those product owners or product owner teams, they might be doing customer field trips. Now, there are other ways to talk to our customers, especially if you have you know, big digital products. It's not always easy to go and talk to every single person on the planet to see you know, how, how do they like Facebook. Um, so there are other ways of doing that as well. But they might also be looking at how do we deal with regulation? Or how do we influence the regulation? How do we get sales? Do we understand if I were to deliver this feature in our product, how can I actually understand are our customers willing to pay for this? Or are they just saying, yeah, I'd like that feature, but you know, I'm assuming it's free, right? Um, and then also spending time with the teams. Because in the Agile Manifesto, it says that the business and development team work together daily. We want to give them that clarity. We want to make sure that if they have questions about, hey, when you were at that customer and that oil rig, what did their you know, facility look like? Or, or were they wearing gloves? Do we have the ability to give them a, a touch screen instead of um, them actually using a, a, a computer? So hopefully, they have the ability to spend time with their customers as well as dealing with their stakeholders. Now, on the other side, we're asking the executive leadership team to focus on a couple of other things, like leadership accountability. We don't want to just deliver a bunch of features, and we haven't talked to our customers, and we haven't gotten any feedback from them, and we're not actually making any of the progress that we're expecting. So we need to actually hold people accountable. But I say that in saying that people also are allowed to make a leap of faith and say, hey, this is something that I think that would work. And as long as they don't spend the next six years working on that thing that will maybe sometimes work even though we're not making progress, th that's fine. We want, we want to make sure that people have the ability to experiment. We want to make sure that we're innovating. Because if they don't, we won't be spending money on R&D and we will end up you know, dying as a, as a company. They're also going to help create and kill products. So not only am I going to say, hey, here's a new thing that we should create, but also, what are the things that we need to kill? What are the things that we need to turn off? Um, I'm at a company right now, and they have a billion dollars of budget in U US dollars. And 70% of that budget is to keep the lights on. Yeah, I was like, what? <laughs> But because they haven't killed anything, they haven't turned anything off, they're spending all of this time and money on stuff that probably no one's using. So let's figure out when do we actually kill a product? When do we say, hey, we're going to migrate this to a new platform, or we're just going to turn it off because no one needs to send us faxes for sales, right? So we need to make sure that we're holding people accountable for that. And then change management, how do we help the organization change? And then there's this really funny thing on incremental funding. Now, maybe they've made more progress here in Europe, but in the States, there's still so many companies that spend six months working on their annual budget, budget cycle. And the funny thing is they generally start that saying, hey, I think I'm going to get about this much money. And then they do all of this work that everyone says is waste, and they somehow draw a line because that's the amount of money that they got. Right? Yeah. So let's just get rid of that whole process and just give us that number and then we'll prioritize and we'll tell you what are the outcomes that we're planning on doing. And we'll talk about that in a little bit. So Liz Wiseman, she wrote this book, Multipliers, and this really ties to the previous slide. She talks about the ability for leaders to be able to create two times the intelligence of teams. 
She actually talks about the ability to increase your IQ when working with teams if you do these uh, couple of steps. So how do you optimize the talent? How do you build intensity to get people to think about how do we solve really hard problems? Extending challenges, allowing the team to debate, and really think about how can we create the best things in our backlog? How can we, in the most simple way, solve our customers' problems? And engaging them from the very beginning, instead of leadership pushing it down and say, thou shalt go do these things. Instead, really empowering the team and the product owner, the team of product owners, to figure out what are the things that we're trying to solve? What are the problems that we're trying to solve? And how is that going to help us to move the needle? And then that helps us with instilling ownership and driving accountability. Then this guy, Patrick Lencioni, the guy I talked about a little bit before, he wrote this book on the advantage. And he says that as a leadership team, hey, they need to actually act as a team as well. They don't just need to be, hey, I'm the head of this specific department, and that means that I'm going to work with my team, but I'm not going to work with the leadership team. So maybe they should start to act as a team. And he says that they need to start to create clarity. And so maybe it's not just at the highest levels of the organization and those executives, but maybe we need to figure out how do we start to work together with product owners to create clarity? Do they understand why they exist? Do they understand what we need to do and how we will be successful in our products? And what's the most important thing for us to do right now? So um, this is a, a slide from Scrum at Scale. Um, so in this case, if we have a product owner or a chief product owner or chief chief product owner, hopefully for whatever scale or scope that they are specifically focused on, they're creating a vision and they're making that vision visible. And then over time, they are going to get together on a regular basis. They're, they might have their chief product owner come together with a team of product owners. Maybe they'll have someone like a UX person or, or an architect um, also participating on that team and helping them. And hopefully they'll have stakeholders, whether those are customers or people within the organization. And they're going to have one aligned backlog so that across the organization we understand what are the most important products um, and the most important things in our backlog. And the teams are going to pull those backlogs. We're hopefully not pushing them. And we're going to go through this a couple of different stages. Um, we're going to regularly update those things. We're regularly going to say, hey, what, did, what happened last time? What are we going to do now? What are the things that we actually learned from our customers? Are they willing to pay for our products? Or are they just saying, hey, this is a, this is a fun thing? So another interesting thing by Mark Kirsten, and he's worked with uh, Gene Kim. You may have know Gene from the Phoenix Project. He also talks about, from a product perspective, making sure that we're not just focusing on one thing, but that we're distributing the amount of work that we're actually doing. So we need to focus on how do we kill those defects? How do I get rid of that $700 million of like, keeping the lights on and, and focus on, on making that smaller? But then also, how do I focus on, on delivering new features? How do I get rid of my technical debt? How do we work together as a team to do those so that we can actually deliver real business value? Then, as we take a look at those metrics, we might actually figure out, how do we decide what are those metrics? How do we decide what metrics to pick? So OKRs, Objectives and Key Results, there are two books that you could read if you want to learn a little bit more about this. But they specifically focus on having a balance of metrics. And so there was a talk on Monday about metrics, lies, <laughs> metrics and statistics. Um, so if we have the ability to focus our, our metrics or to balance our metrics so that we're not just saying, hey, how many new customers did we get or how many interactions did we get, but we're actually making sure that we're driving um, the most value possible, that's what we want. Now there's this thing that says no cascading metrics. Well, I'm the CEO of the organization and this is the goal. Then I have a vice president, and they're going to come up with a goal, and that's going to cascade down to the director. Well, that's not necessarily a good idea, because we want the teams to understand what's the big goal. And how can we as a team, or we as a product owner team, have the ability to deliver on those most important things for the organization? 
And we might want to look at what are some short-term things that we can actually measure, and then what are some longer-term things that we can measure as well. We might call those proxy, um, proxy metrics that we're actually looking at and measuring. So let's, I'm going to walk you through a case study. Um, there is a book out there that I did not write. Um, uh, Jeff Sutherland and Jim Copelian uh, wrote it. It's on the, the Scrum Plop patterns. And uh, this is one of the things that are in there, but this is a specific case study that we did at a large global manufacturing organization. So this particular organization, they were lots of fun. In 2001, they basically laid off all of their technical resources. Sounds like a good idea, right? They outsourced all of it and sent it off to various partners, um, mostly in India. And then in about 2010, 2011, this company said, oh my goodness, we don't know anything about our technical products. We have no idea how any of it works. And the people who say that they work in IT, like I think they're just vendor managers, but they haven't written any code, they couldn't do any queries on any databases, and they really don't even own the relationships with the, with the business. They're really just to tick off the, the, check, the check boxes for vendor management and dealing with these partners that are generally off, offshore. So in 2010, 2011, they said, OK, let's bring in technical expert, uh, some more technical expertise. So they said, we're going to hire mid-career people, and we're going to start to bring that knowledge back in. And so they were following the Spotify model, and they created all of these teams. And the teams started to work on this backlog, and the team said, hey, do you know that your project is basically the same exact as your project, and there's a 75% overlap with what your project is? Have you people talked at all, like ever? And the answer was no. And that was because they had created these silos within their organizations. So the people who were in services didn't talk to the people who were in finance, who didn't talk to the people who were, who were in diagnostics. And so as the organization, they were wasting millions of dollars on products, and their customers were ticked off because they were given 20 different tools that they'd have to log into this one, and then log into this one, and then log into this one, because none of it was actually connected. Then we had to go to all of those people who had previously been vendor managers, and now they were put into some sort of product role. And we had to talk to them about what does it actually mean to do project product management or to really be a product owner. And so we had to focus, there, focus them on what is the actual vision of this big thing that you're working on. And then we had them use a lean canvas, but you could use any of the other canvases. And we started to have them doing demonstrations to each other. And so as you can imagine in a really old, really big company, you know, these meetings are really not important to me. I'm just going to come and I'm going to, you know, do my emails and check Facebook and Twitter and do whatever else. And then when it's my turn to talk, I'll put my, my uh, laptop down and I'll, I'll spew out whatever knowledge and information that there is. And then when my report out is done, then I'm going to go to someone else. Have you guys ever been to a meeting like that? Yeah, a few? Okay. I've been to lots of those. Really not good. So after some period of time, people would start to say, we call them bingo words, where you like, wait a second, what, what did you say? What are you working on? I'm sorry. Actually, that's my product. You shouldn't be working on that. Why, why are you working on that? I should be working on that. So it was kind of phase two. We got them to start to work together. And then phase three, they actually started to work together in gel as a team. So as a team then, they would say, oh, that's great. Thank you for doing this thing. I could totally use that. I could totally reuse that. That would work in this place within my specific product. But we had to go through the phases of actually getting them to know what the products were within the organization. I mean, it's a $40 billion organization, but it's not that big. I mean, they, they still had the ability to, to learn these things and to share information. So there are about 140 teams um, that were being kind of leveraged through this whole thing. We had them meet every single week, somewhere between two and four hours. But in the beginning, we had one brave soul who would come and say, this is what I think the vision of my product is. 
And this is what I think are my problems with my, pro with my customers and who my customers are. And this is how we're making money or we think we're going to make money. And this is how we're um, going to save money or, or um, what, what it's going to cost. They also thought about the metrics. How are we going to track and see are we going down the right path? And so we started to push them into this process of hypotheses. What hypo hypothesis do you have? What is something that you can actually demonstrate and measure sometime in the next two to four months? Can your teams actually go and build that? Oh, okay, well, the value is going to be super huge and super awesome. So maybe we should shut down one of the other um, products that we're doing after that gets to a point when it's good to, to close that off. And maybe we're actually going to restructure some of those teams. So up here, you can see that we've got the PLM team, so the product life cycle management team, and maybe they would roll off of their team of teams that was focused on a specific product, and maybe they would roll over to another mission. But if that was the mission that was most important to the company, because we couldn't get products out to our customers, and that was the biggest, most important thing for our customers, then we would restructure those teams to make sure that we were working on the right thing. And then those product owners would actually get to learn more about those products that they weren't even associated with and they weren't connected to. But the biggest thing was, what's the next most important thing that you're going to learn? What metrics are you going to track? And then in two to four months, we want you to come back before we give you any more money to show us what you actually did and what was the outcome and what didn't work. Because for a lot of these big companies, they don't want to know or they don't want to share what actually didn't work because they're not used to that. So a typical uh, agenda for this strategic product alignment session or a meta scrum could look something like this. So on a weekly basis, coming in and first saying, did we learn anything? Did anything change in our priorities? Was there something big and political that happened? Are airplanes falling out of the sky? That has happened. Um, <laughs> is there anything else that's, ha that's happened that we've learned about that we actually need to, to change or update? Then we'll actually go through those lean canvases and we'll go through those demos and we'll understand what's actually happening. We'll figure out, do we need to kill new products or did someone have an idea to create a new product? And we'll update those overall enterprise-wide backlogs. And if we need to, we'll restructure our team of teams. So um, to wrap up, we've got our product owners. They have superpowers. So they all come with different perspectives. They come with different backgrounds. They come with different domain knowledge. But we actually want them to work together as a team. We want them to create trust. We want them to go see our customers. We want to understand what are those biggest problems and how can we most simply solve those problems. We want to make sure that we're constantly learning and sharing from each other and ensuring that the organization as a whole is working on the most important things for our customers. Because they're being able to do this and because they're empowered as product owners, they actually have the ability to determine their own destiny. And so we've heard a number of times about being empowered and being able to choose what are the things that you're going to work on and how can we deliver things that are impactful for our customers. And so by creating these product owner teams, we've seen that we've had, we have the ability for those people to understand the bigger picture and for them to really see how can we help improve the lives of our customers. So with that, thank you for attending my talk and we've got some time for questions.